and uh, had uh, a lovely breakfast uh, at your place in uh, you know Israel, and um, it was wonderful to have that conversation. Well, you know, I came out of it and I said to my wife Sarah, you know, this guy really knows what he's talking about. I, I said uh, he's the Edison of our time, and I, I think I probably dealt you a. a uh, sort of a backhanded slap because uh, what about the Tesla of our time? <laughs> you know. uh, yeah, I, I think te I'm got a long way to go before I anywhere near Tesla. I think, um, but um, yeah, it was a, it was a great conversation. Um, we touched on a number of subjects, um, and um, yeah, so uh, we, we're we're at a very interesting juncture in the world uh, from a technology standpoint. If you say, there's, there's so many things happening. If you were to plot the, the various types of technology on a chart, um, you know, the modern era, and I'd say even just like really the last 20 years, certainly the last 100 years from the dawn of human civilization, uh, the growth of technology just looks like a wall. It's, it's a technology is improving at a sort of a hyper exponential rate. And we obviously want to make sure that the technology uh, is something that benefits uh, humanity and um, to the greatest extent possible. Uh, so, uh, and, and we're going to go in, in depth into artificial intelligence, which is potentially the, the biggest uh, civilizational threat. I say potentially, so I, I'm trying not to be sort of a, uh, whatever, a scaremonger or something. Um, but when you're talking about having something that is an intelligence far in excess of the smartest human on earth, um, you have to say, at that point, who's in charge? Um, is it the computers or the humans? Um, and you know, there, there's some interesting ratios that I think are, are quite profound, like one of them being the ratio of digital to biological compute. So if you, if you take also the, all the human brains and then all the, the computer you know, circuits and you say, What's that ratio? The ratio of digital to biological computers is increasing dramatically every year because the population of Earth is fairly static, but the output of silicon is dramatically increased. Um, it, 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 so at, at basically at a certain point, with the percentage of compute that will be biological is very small. Um, and um, anyway, I, it's some of these technologies like, and I'm a technologist, and I bear some responsibility for the creation of uh, artificial intelligence, at least you know a little bit, um, and I think we just want to make sure that we're guiding things to a technological, uh, you know, a, po a positive future, uh, and, and reduce the probability of a negative one. Well, I call it I call it the uh, the blessing and the curse. You know, uh, 3,500 years ago when Moses. Uh, uh, steered the people, uh, the children of Israel, to the promised land, and he was standing outside and he said, you're going into the promised land and you're going to find a choice between two things, a blessing and a curse. And he said, you better choose the blessing, which was the blessing of life and not the curse of death. And I think in many ways we stand today at a, a juncture for all humanity where we have to choose between a blessing and a curse. The blessings of AI are amazing. And we see them already in Israel. We see them around the world. You, you can see the addition of decades of life to uh, the human lifespan. Precision uh, medicine dedicated to uh, every person's uh, genetic composition. Robots. I know you know nothing about this. Robots who care for the elderly. <laughs> I think yeah. you're making some of them here. Uh, you could have precision agriculture and uh, um, autonomous uh, factories that create abundance beyond our imagination. Uh, what you call the end of scarcity, which is a departure in human history. You can have all these blessings. You can have the end of traffic jams, you know, with subground, above ground, and in the air, AI-driven vehicles, all these things that are real promise. But at the same time, you've got the curse. And the curse could be manifold. It could be the disruption of democracy, uh, the interference, the manipulation of minds, uh, crime syndicates, uh, AI-driven wars that go uncontrollable, and what you, you said just now, which is the stuff of science fiction. I mean, we used to read these things. We used to read Isaac Asimov, you know? Uh, that machines will control humans as opposed to the other way around. 
And I'll tell you the worst thing about it is what you said earlier, which is that the pace of change is increasing so fast. I mean, it took us, uh, you know, centuries at least to adapt to the agricultural revolution. It took us maybe a century to adapt to the industrial revolution. Uh, we may have just but a few years and then we're running out as we speak to adapt to the AI revolution. And I'm not sure that we are, certainly not in curbing the, the curses. And as a leader of a country that is an AI player and could be a big player if we have our way, and I think we will, now we want to increase the blessings for not only for ourselves, but for all of humanity. We've done that with other technological innovations that came out of Israel but in many other places. But the real question is, what do we do? What do we do internationally? What do we do globally to contain the threat? So if you were, well, you can't be, uh, you can't be president of the US last time I checked, right? But assume you are. Not officially. Not officially. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're the unofficial, <laughs> unofficial president. What do you suggest we do to curb the, to curb the curses and increase the blessings. Well, that, that's that's what uh, you know. Part of this discussion is about. Um, so I, I've actually uh, met with a number of uh, world leaders, um, and uh, to talk about uh, AI risk, uh, because uh, I think for a lot of people, they don't unless you're really immersed in the technology, you don't know just what how significant the risk can be. Um, I think the reward is also very positive, so I don't want to be, you know, I'm not in the, it, I, I tend to view the future uh, as a series of, prob of probabilities. There's a certain probability that something will go, you know, wrong, s some probability it'll go right. Uh, it's kind of a spectrum of, of, of things. And to the degree that there is free will versus determinism, um, then we, we want to try to uh, exercise that free will to uh, ensure a, a great future. Um, so, you know, and, and the, the, the single biggest rebuttal that I've gotten um, among leaders in the West with regard to uh, AI is that, <clears throat> is that, well, sure, the West might regulate AI, AI, but what about China? Because to your point about which countries will have significant leadership in AI, China is certainly one of them, um, one of the, the very top, or, you know, potentially number one. Um, so, um, you know, so if China basically does not regulate while others do, then will then will the other countries be at a disadvantage? Is that the, that's the, that's the single most common rebuttal that I got? So I went, uh, you know, I went to China, met with uh, some of the senior leadership, and I talked about the risks of AI. And um, you know, one of the points I made is that if you make it, if you create a digital super intelligence. Um, that, that digital superintelligence, if it is sufficiently powerful and, there's, and care is not taken, that digital superintelligence could be in charge of, of China instead of the CCP being in charge of China. I think that argument yeah, did resonate. Must have gotten some attention. Yeah, the CCP pr pr prefers to be in charge. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, you know, a bit of a dry house we've got here, anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I think the, the, the um, you know, they understand the argument like, look, if you create digital God and now that is the boss of you, you know, that's not something that yeah, appeals well, to them. So, well, let me give, or let, any government. Yeah, I, I think there's another thing, though. I mean, I, I see this as three layers. How, how do you, I've been thinking about this ever since we spoke about it. How do we, and I read some of the, the books, including some of the people that we're going to talk about the later, Tegmark's book, which I thought was really absorbing and, and stimulating. But how do, you, how do you get the international regime to control this thing, okay? Well, okay, if you look at it and you look at, um, you, you know, the first thing you can do is get like-minded states, I call them the like-minded smarts, to agree on a code of ethics and a code of conduct, and that's pretty easy. We can do it among our, within our countries and between our countries. And we can cooperate to ensure the blessings and curb the curse as much as we can. Uh, we do that in civil aviation, we do it in other things too, okay? And we do that actually beyond the democracies. The second tier is the other regimes, the other systems. And there, I look at nuclear weapons, okay? How did we control nuclear weapons? 
we really, everybody says, well, we had treaties, we had arrangements. That's not what controlled nuclear weapons. What controlled nuclear weapons and gave us 75 years of nuclear peace is deterrence. Basically, MAD, what they call mutually assured destruction. That was enough, and I hope will be enough, to contain the, um, the, the curses inherent in these mass uh, weapons of mass, uh, 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 mass destruction. I think there is something beyond that machines will take over. It's that if we don't have a code of conduct between the major powers, you'll have, uh, you'll have MAC, mutually assured chaos. If anybody punches the other side and you'll have a response, then you'll have a runaway chain of events that could foster such global disruption that everybody loses. So that may persuade the established powers and superpowers. But then you have the third problem, which I think is the most difficult one. What do you do about what they call bad actors, which is a laundered way of saying rogue states, uh, crime syndicates, uh, runaway corporations? How about runaway individuals? I mean, like, remember the James Bond movie where you see the guy in some island and he's manufacturing this, the specter argument you have? But to do that, you need computation, you need big data, and you need basically algorithms and very able people. Could we trace that? Could we control that? Assuming we got the first part, the like-minded smarts, and then we had some kind of code of conduct and de mutual deterrence among the big guys, could we police the planet against the little guys uh, and, or the rogue, the rogue factors? Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's a great question. Um, and I think the, the answer with respect to digital superintelligence is, is yes, because you know, yeah, the, the <clears throat> although like if you see a movie like say Terminator, the, you, know, you see the, the intelligence appears to be in the robot, but actually the intelligence is in large uh, data centers, large server centers. So think of it more like, if you see some of these data centers, you just see computers, as, like you can practically see the curvature of the earth, that's how long the corridors are. I mean these gigantic massive warehouses or buildings with um, in, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of, of computers. Um, the, it, for, for, for extreme digital superintelligence, that's the, that, that's, it's not subtle. So it's, it's, it's not the, someone in barriers, a, What you're saying is there are barriers to entry that, you, that will be difficult to overcome. What, I, what I'm saying is that you'll be able to see the, if, you know, if you have an infrared camera from space, you'll be able to see where the, it's, it's traceable. located. <laughs> you can, you can actually it. identify it. Yes, because if you've got a sort of, say, a 100 megawatt yeah. uh, data center, uh, that you're going to have 100 megawatts of heat rise, he, uh, heat column. So in infrared, this will show up like, a, you know, it won't be subtle. It's, it's not very, a drug dealer. Clear. It's not it's a drug space. dealer in the Amazon <laughs> who's doing this, you know. No, you, it's hard to hide a giant server center. Uh, maybe at the bottom of the ocean or something. But I mean, it, it, it requires a lot of capital. It require, it, it's a lot of power. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not something that you can just sort of hide in a small location. Well, in, in the case of nuclear weapons, there are two principal components, which are the, you know, the sort of the, uh, the necessary and in many ways sufficient. And that is you have the capacity to enrich u uranium, which requires these plants. And you have to have uh, basically nuclear scientists. And the nuclear scientists you can fit in a room smaller than this to produce a nuclear device. Yeah. But you can trace the other component fairly well, so we know. Uh, and you know we're doing our best to prevent it. Rogue states from having it, principally Iran. But what you're saying is there is a definable uh, universe, a small one actually, of uh, capable actors yeah. in, in AI, which I, I think is good news. I mean, it allows, at least for the hope of some kind of uh, regulation or yeah. some kind of controls over it. Yeah, that, that, that essentially is what I think gives some hope for at least digital superintelligence. Now, you, you can certainly have, um, you should really think of AI as a spectrum, uh, like a very, very wide range um, of simple AI uh, that will do, you know, 
automatic calendaring or something. Or, in fact, one thing would be much would be much appreciated is if we could apply a better AI for uh, autocorrect on uh, my phone, because that would be a <laughs> great benefit. Um, <laughs> if you, in fact, if, if AI, AI is so great, why is autocorrect uh, to suck? <laughs> you know, it's sort of like anyway. But, but there's very there's varying degrees of auto, of of AI that that go from doing simple functions to levels of intelligence that I think are hard for us to comprehend as individuals. And, and at the very high level, the, one, the, the stuff that's least understandable requires massive amount of power, a large number of computers, um, and the right software, and the right data, and everything. So it's, it's not, it's something you'd notice. It's not, you can't, difficult to hide. Um, so, sort of similar to uranium, you can sort of detect the uranium uh, radiation, you know. Uh, I, I agree with you. It's actually very easy to build nukes. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, we're trying to make it harder on the bad guys, you know. We're doing our best, uh, yeah. and I, I've devoted a good chunk of my uh, my uh, uh, adult life to preventing Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons because it's uh, it's a bad actor. And, you know, it's a chance death to Israel, death to America, and they want to have ICBMs to deliver that threat. And you don't want them to be able to reach uh, Fremont or... Uh, New York or uh, Dallas or any place else, yeah. with, and threaten you and blackmail you. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you a funny anecdote about uh, Iran in this case. Um, so we, we got permission from the U.S. State Department to turn on Starlink uh, over Iran, um, and uh, you know, so there's a few people are using it, and, and we, we got a sort of upset letter from the government of Iran. Uh, but but actually, the the letter was so polite that I, you know I expected to be sort of angry or something, but it was it was polite to a degree that I think, like Charles Dickens level polite, polite you know. Um, and, and, and I was expecting to see, you know, P.S. death to America and Israel or something like that, you know. <laughs> but but it, 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 they didn't have that, Elon, so I was like. The, <laughs> Elon, they, they tried to kill the Secretary yeah. of State of the United States and the National Security Advisor. I mean, that's really chutzpah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so don't. Uh, don't, no, no, be, don't be calmed I'm, by, I'm, I'm by, not, I'm just, I just thought it was by Charles I, I Dickens' it, language. No, no, it was, it was very nice language, but I, and I was mm -hmm. like, sort of, it would have been just, frankly, just pretty epic if it said, P.S., you know, death to America. <laughs> I was like, by the way, death to America. <laughs> I don't know, it was, it was just a... Well, that, that's, <laughs> that, that's an interesting subject, which I hope we can pursue later on today. Uh, but I think, you know, I think these regimes basically are based on the ability to... Uh, to control the minds of their people, and to the extent that you can, you can facilitate what I know you believe in deeply, which is uh, pluralistic views to be heard. Well, you know, people are discussing it uh, all over the place in in, in the free world, but the, what makes the unfree world unfree is that you can't have this discussion. Yeah, yeah you, you exactly. can't do anything. Right, uh, totally. Um, no, I, I think it's. Um, you know, I think the 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 founders of the United States, or shortly thereafter, with the First Amendment being free speech, was a very wise uh, amendment. Because you said, why did they care about that so much? Is because the places that they came from, they were they they didn't have free speech. So you know, um, the, pl the places they immigrated from, the, the speech was you know the press and everything was very much controlled. Um, and uh, to your point, it I think. If, if you don't have free speech and discussion of, of, of often difficult con and contentious ideas that necessarily not everyone agrees with, then you you, you, you don't really, it's very, very difficult to have uh, an effective democracy or, or because the people are voting based on the information that they receive. And if they do not know what's going on or if they're fed a false narrative, then they cannot make their vote, uh, they cannot vote sensibly because they don't have the information. Well, I, I know I know your commitment to free speech. I respect that because I think it's an integral, it's the foundational thing of, of democracies, really. But uh, I also know your opposition to anti-Semitism. You've spoken about it, uh, tweeted about it. Uh, and all I can say is I hope you find within the, the confines of the First Amendment the ability to uh, stop not only anti-Semitism or roll it back as best you can, but any collective uh, hatred of a people that uh, you know anti-Semitism represents, uh, and I know you're committed to that. I hope I hope you succeed in it. It's not an easy task, but I I encourage you and urge you to uh, find the balance. Uh, it's a tough one. Yeah, I mean, I think generally, um, I mean, I'm I'm sort of against uh, attacking any group. You know, um, 
doesn't matter who it is. I'm, you know, this is, I, I'm, I'm in favor of that which furthers civilization and which ultimately leads us to become a space-bearing civilization um, and uh, where we understand the nature of the universe. Um, so we, we can't do that if, if there's a lot of, uh, in, you know, infighting and, um, you know, and, and hatred and negativity. So, uh, you know, I, obviously I'm against anti-Semitism. I'm against anti really anything um, that is, uh, you know, that promotes hate and conflict. Um, and I'm in favor of that, which helps build society and take us to a better future um, for humanity collectively. So, and, and, and now this sometimes is, is, is this like, I, I, and, I, and I think one can actually argue that really everyone should have this view. Um, it, it, you, all, it, all it requires is long-term thinking. And if you're long-term thinking, you say like, okay, well, so basically you can say like, even if, and, and hypothetically, uh, if, if someone is say completely self, self-centered, um, well, it's like, well, can you, how, how, do, how would you feel about if you didn't have civilization? It's very easy to figure that out. Just go into the forest with nothing and uh, see how long you want to live there. Um, just watch an episode of Naked and Afraid mm. and- See uh, how long you live, you may die very yeah, quickly. Yeah, no, exactly. So it's like civilization turns out is pretty nice, actually, mm. uh, for, you know, we may quibble about civilization, but it's easy to experience not civilization by just, you know, going into some place where there are no people and seeing, um, you know, what, what it's like, and, it, and you very quickly come back to civilization. So, unless you're Ted Kaczynski or something, you know. Um, so, <laughs> he liked living in the forest. Um, so, yeah, um, so the, 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 you know, now, now free speech does at, at times mean that somebody, someone you don't like is saying something you don't like. Um, if you don't have that, then you, you, it's it's not it's not free speech. Um, now that doesn't mean some sort of negativity has to should be pushed upon people because um, if it, for for the X platform, if unless it's enter, it's it's interesting, entertaining, engaging, um, then you, we will lose uh, users. People will, will want to not use our system if they um, find it to be unpleasant. Um, our, our overarching goal for the X platform is to maximize unregretted user time. So um, if you spend half an hour on the X platform, did you learn a lot? Uh, did you, did you, were you entertained? Did you perhaps laugh a little bit? In fact, I, I find it to be the, the best source of humor. Uh, I, I laugh more for on stuff that I read on X than everything else combined. So. You know, I think that's a, that's a good thing. Um, but it's also important to bear in mind that there are uh, 500 million, um, 550 million monthly users, now going to maybe 600 million monthly users. Um, and, uh, you know, the, and, and, and any given day, there's um, on the order of 100 to 200 million posts to the system. There's a lot of, this is a lot of material. Um, so in amongst the 100 or 200 million and I'm excluding retweets and so, well, reposts, uh, the, as I say, <laughs> new, new wording. <laughs> um, you know, some of those are going to be bad. Um, it's impossible to say, uh, you, and you can't police it in advance, but you can say uh, after the fact, oh, it's getting reported as hate speech. Okay, well, we're going to de-amplify. We're, we're not going to promote hate speech, so because we think probably people, that's not what people want to hear. You know? Well, I, I, th I think the, the other thing is that it doesn't stop you from coming out as, uh, as you have and as uh, I do on every possible forum and condemn, uh, condemn uh, anti-Semitism. You know, it's uh, just this collective hatred of a people. You say they have to be banished. They don't have a right to exist. They don't have a right to a state of their own and so on. And the vile things that are said, I don't care if they come from the hard left or from the hard right or white supremacists or uh, I don't know ultra progressives uh, for me that's something that I condemn and I think that it's important to come out and that's quite a separate question that the condemnation is quite separate from the question of access uh, the one access idea that I have and I, I don't even know if it's technically possible is to prevent the use of uh, you know bots armies of bots yeah. to uh, to replicate and uh, amplify it so at least if you get a crazy guy and a, a hateful guy let him be 
speaking for one voice rather than uh, arming, uh, you know, an army of and an, an army of fake millions to, uh, to do this. Absolutely, this is this is actually a super tough, super tough problem, um, and um, it's part of the really I'd say that maybe the single single most important reason that we're moving to having a small uh, monthly payment uh, for uh, use of the X system is. Uh, it's, it's, it's the only way I can think of to combat uh, vast armies of bots, uh, because a, a bot costs a fraction of a penny, call it a tenth of a penny. But if, if, uh, if somebody even has to pay you know, a few dollars or something, some, some minor amount, the, the, the effective cost of, of bots is very high, and then you also have to uh, get a new payment uh, me method every time you have a new bot. So th that, that actually, the constraint of how many different you know, credit cards you can find even on the dark web or whatever. Um, th this uh, and, and and then pr so prioritizing uh, posts that are written by uh, basically ex premium subscribers. Um, and we're, we're actually going to come out with a lower tier pricing. For, so it's, you know, just we just want we want it to be just a small amount of money. Th this is the uh, uh, and it's a longer discussion, but in my view, this is actually the only defense against vast armies of bots. Because as the AI gets very, uh, very good, it, it's actually able to pass uh, these sort of capture tests better than humans. In fact, one of the ways you might say, like, wait a second, this passing the test too fast. Uh, that must, it must be a robot. You know, it must be AI, because uh, a human would be much slower. Than but you're human. saying you're saying that all these things are happening at such a rapid exponential rate that our discussion, the means we're talking about, we're really so far behind the curve uh, that we're not really addressing uh, as leaders, leaders of uh, technology, leaders of nations, leaders of technological nations, we're not really addressing these massive changes that are changing uh, humanity and our world and our future. Uh, not in the future, it's right now. And we're not dealing with it. And I'm, you know, I'm coming here to talk about what we do uh, because you know nobody's done it before. Usually, I'm a fairly—I don't want to say I'm a lazy reformer. I helped reform the Israeli economy from a semi-socialist economy to one of the most vibrant uh, free market economies. But you know, I could do that by saying, "Look, let's look at what you know what the successful countries did." And it was pretty easy. You could cap, uh, copy uh, uh, market—you uh, know—market uh, economies. That was pretty easy. Hard to do, but easy to conceptualize. Uh, when we had to deal with cyber, there was no model, and we just went along, changed ourselves as we went along and figured out how to make Israel, you know, one of the leading cyber powers to protect ourselves. Yeah. But when I look here, there's really no one to look at. So I came to you, uh, and I look forward to the meeting we're going to have uh, in, a, in, in a short while to talk about what is it, what's the model that a democratic country, and I have to say Israel will be always a democratic country. What it, does a democratic country do? How does it cooperate with other democracies? How does it cooperate with other nations to get a handle on this, I don't want to say on this, I don't want to say this demon that has been released. Uh, you didn't create a demon, don't <laughs> worry. <laughs> you didn't create a demon, but you created the blessing and it's got a curse next to it. It doesn't come, doesn't come free. And I think we don't, we don't have much time and I, I think this is the single most important development uh, in our lifetime and in many ways in, perhaps in history. So we, we don't have much time to deal with shaping our future. And, and that, is, that is really my uh, greatest interest for my country, but not only for my country, for, for everyone. I, I couldn't agree more. Actually, I guess before we um, bring the um, other participants on, uh, speaking of Israel, um, <laughs> speak of it. Uh, there's, there's, um, as, as you saw, some some uh, protesters outside, um, and uh, I, you know, I've, to be frank, probably got the most amount of negative pushback from people at Tesla about this interview than anything else I've ever done. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, if, if maybe if you could take a few moments to address, oh, sure. uh, you know, the, the, I think it's the, primarily the judicial reform question. Sure. Um, yeah. Well, it's a good opportunity to tell people who are protesting to at least so they know what they're yeah, yeah, what, what they're what, protesting about, you know, because uh, because I think many of them don't know. 
Uh, and there's a concerted effort to make sure they don't know. Uh, look, the first thing I'd say is what I repeat what I just, just said a minute ago. Israel was, is, and will always be a robust democracy. Uh, but it, it, it's changed its, uh, uh, I would say, its character subtly and imperceptibly about uh, three decades ago. And I'd say this all goes back to uh, a very uh, uh, sort of a, a very bitter day in Athens about 2,400 years ago. Okay. There's this, yeah, that's where it starts. <laughs> okay. I told you history has its roots. Well, there's this uh, brilliant 28-year-old man who sees his beloved teacher forced to uh, drink a cup of hemlock, you know, Socrates, and he says, uh, and it was forced by the Athenian assembly, the, the democracy of Athens. And uh, Plato says, and that's a 28-year-old man, he says, what is this crazy system, this democracy? There has to be a better thing. And the better thing, he says, is a utopia where the philosopher is king. You know who the philosopher is. It's, oh. it's Plato. <laughs> it's Plato. Yeah. And he says, how will, how will he govern? He'll govern with 300 guardians that he'll appoint, uh, you know, and they'll appoint the, their successors and so on. Now, this idea sort of ambled its way through the Middle Ages and was soundly rejected in modern times, first by John Locke and then Montesquieu and then the, uh, the fathers of the American Revolution. I mean, the curious thing was, I mean, Plato said you have to have elevated people, enlightened people to rule and not the, the masses, right? But then you had these brilliant people, yeah. Madison, Hamilton, all these guys, and they said, no, no, it's not the enlightened people. The people rule. It's we the people, not we the elites. We the people rule. But the way you rule and the way you balance in democracies, majority rule and uh, uh, individual rights, is a balance between the three branches of government. Okay? In Israel, that balance 30 years ago began to change. And we have the most activist judicial court on the planet. So it steadily arrogated to itself the powers of the legislature, and the, uh, and the executive, where it basically decides. Democracy is supposed to be checks and balances of the three branches on each other. Uh, in Israel, the judiciary has no checks and no balances. It just has power. And so there's a request to try to bring it back into line. Uh, and that has been uh, sort of boiling all the time. Uh, I came in, and there was a, a proposal put in, which I thought was bad which is to reject one imbalance by creating another imbalance. If the court can rule against any decision made by the, uh, the government or the uh, parliament, then let's now correct it by having the parliament reject any decision with a simple majority that the court makes. I thought that's a mistake. It's moving the pendulum from one side to the other side. It has to be in a happy middle. I've been looking for that happy middle. I have a majority in the parliament, in the Knesset, to legislate anything, but I didn't. I held back because I want this to be a consensus. And so we made the minimal changes that would bring back a little of the balance that we had in Israel's first 50 years, uh, and that's what we're trying to do now. I'm still reaching for a consensus. If I can't reach it with my the other side of the political aisle, which becomes very difficult in today's democracies with the, you know, with the polarizing effect of social media, uh, and big money and big data that is used to polarize even further, to arrange demonstrations anywhere on the planet, uh, then, uh, you know, if I can't do it with the other side of the aisle, then I want to do it with the public. That is to have as broad a consensus for a minor correction, basically some correction on how we choose judges, because otherwise we have, you know, basically 15, in many ways, unelected officials. By the way, I, I think gifted people, good people, but they replace the government. They're sort of unelected, and they decide everything. That's not exactly democracy. So we're trying to get Israel back to where it was before. I hope we succeed. I can tell you that as soon as I get back to Israel after this week, that's what I'm going to focus my attention on. Uh, I hope we succeed. But it's not, you know, I'm described as something between, uh, I don't know, Attila the Hun and Genghis Khan. Uh, Elon, you read a lot of books. I read. <laughs> I read the Federalist uh, papers a couple of times, you know. I'm versed in, uh, in, in the theories of democracy and the balance between the three branches of government. That's what I'm trying to achieve, nothing more. And it's, uh, it's not an easy thing to be uh, maligned. I know you've never seen that, right? Uh, no, you've I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, no, I, I've, me maligned, never. <laughs> um, 
So, uh, yeah, no, I, I guess, uh, and everyone, don't, don't, we don't want to spend obviously too much time on the subject since this is primarily about AI, AI sort of existential risk, but, um, uh, and it's difficult for people here to say, know exactly how other systems work. Um, but certainly the, 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 the press in the U.S. has not portrayed um, the reforms you mentioned in a positive light. They, uh, well, spe especially the New York Times. I mean, they're in yeah. a fantastic, obsessive campaign. <laughs> but they, they usually get it wrong, so it's, it's not important. So, I mean, maybe, it, it, yeah, um, in, in the U.S., uh, like the, the courts cannot really produce new laws, but they can... Um, Nullify. They, 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 provided it's against the Constitution. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Well, in Israel, we don't. In Israel, we supposedly have basic laws that constitute a constitution. Now, the debate in Israel is whether the court can actually change the basic laws, uh, and uh, it's it's a big debate. I don't want to get into that and uh, g get uh, people into this, but there's always a balance. You know, you know the way you balance uh, the power of the of the people, the majority, uh, with uh, the court in America is that the politicians choose the judges. Okay, that's that's something that uh, you know creates constant tension, obviously, including today. But that's built in the democracy. There's tension between the various branches of government. You have to resolve to make sure that you're somewhere in the middle and not in one of the extremes. And that's what I hope I can achieve in Israel. So that's, uh, and I, I think it'll come out. You know, people will see that Israel was a democracy and will be, in my opinion, a stronger democracy after uh, after the dust settles. Sounds good. <laughs> it's easier than AI. <laughs> yeah, um, sounds good. Well, great. I guess. Uh, but back to AI. Is, is this the proper time to bring uh, the other people on? Only after you answer one of my questions, oh, I sure, wanted sure. to ask you. I want to ask you two questions. Okay. okay. First one is, who's the person that most influenced you? Well, I've been influ influenced by a lot of people. I've, I've read a, a, um, a lot of books. I'm somewhat of a voracious reader of books. Um, I would say. Probably the, the, uh, Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy would be the single most influential book, um, which is really a book on philosophy disguised as humor. Um, so that that that'll probably be my, my number one. I mean, I, I think uh, Lord of the Rings is um, one of my favorite books uh, as well. Uh, Asimov, uh, you know, the Foundation Spirit series was actually quite a uh, helped inspire me um, to try to make life multiplanetary. Um, because I think that inc improves the probable lifespan of civilization. Um, so, um, what about you? Well, the person who most influenced me was my father, who was a, was a great historian. Yeah. Uh, and um, he was also the editor, you, you might find this interesting because you read encyclopedias. He was the editor-in-chief of the Hebrew Encyclopedia. Uh, so he was sort of a polymath, uh, but I once asked him when I, you know, when I decided to run for the prime minister, and I'm, you know, and this is a few decades ago, I've been reelected six times. So I asked him, uh, Father, what is, you know, the most essential quality that you need to be the prime minister of Israel? And he said to me, Well, what do you think? And I said, Well, you have to have a vision, and you have to have the resolve and flexibility to achieve it. Uh, and he said, Well, you need that for anything. And I, I said, so what is the most essential thing? And he said, a word that surprised me. He said, education. You have to have a broad and deep education, otherwise you'll be at the mercy of your clerks. Uh, otherwise you won't navigate the course that you want to reach, you'll be navigated to the course they want to reach. Uh, and I, you know, I found that to be actually very sound advice that I find hard to Maintain, but I read also all the time to increase the intellectual capital and not deplete it. And I think, I think that also makes life more interesting, as I'm sure you do. Um, we both, uh, I think you read more books than I have, but I try to read a lot. Yeah, well, I think that generally would be good advice for you know, uh, kids or ad adults, frankly, is just to read, read more. Who reads today? Do yeah, people read? I know. And unfortunately, I think reading has taken somewhat of a hit. Um, <laughs> 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 that's because people retweet tweets. That's what they do. Well, I, they watch TikTok videos a lot, you know. Um, which it's not you learn something, I suppose. But um, 
there's just there's much less reading. And and the things that I think if 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 I'd had entertaining if I'd had the internet back then with the great movies, video games and that kind of thing, I probably would not have I would have read much less than I did. I was I kind of read the encyclopedia out of desperation cuz I didn't <laughs> have anything else to read, you know. You read the whole encyclopedia? Yeah, pretty I skipped, you know, there, I'd get something that I'm not that interested in and I'll skip past it. So, but uh, yeah, pretty much. Um, That's desperation. Well, it's desperation. No, it's just like I'm running out of books. You know. Well, so, um, but but I think I, th I think it was probably a better encyclopedia than the one you uh, you know these uh, uh, digital encyclopedias today, which are unfortunately are edited uh, in ways that are not you know that yeah. don't necessarily bring out you know the the balanced views of things. Yeah, you know, I mean the funny thing about say like Wikipedia is. You know, the, the, like there's an old saying, like uh, history is written by the by the victors. It's like, well, yes, but not if your enemies are still alive and have a lot of time on their hands to edit Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> history is history is written by the people who can m harness the most editors. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the the, whoever, the loser has just got a lot of time on their hands, and uh, you know, so what are they going to do? Edit Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Um, well, is this, should we perhaps bring? Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, Let's bring him in. Oh, we're going to take a break. Okay. Right. Uh, okay, so it sounds like we're going to, we're going to just, we're going to wrap this, wrap up this, um, and then take a break, and then, and then um, we'll, we'll uh, add Max Tegmark and Greg Brockman. Um, so, uh, is, is there anything, any last words you'd like to say for just the two of us? Well, just I appreciate the opportunity to uh, uh, to pick your brain on something that is so important for the future of my country and the future of the world. And I'm uh, I really think that we don't have much time. We don't have much time. Yeah. Well, one of the things I was well, maybe this is, we'll do it another time. But is you know I went to actually people I went to Hebrew preschool, um, and um, I can sing a pretty good Avon you know. <laughs> uh, so uh, maybe I'm going to have a sing off at some point. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I don't know if we have time today. But <laughs> and, and if you want to, go ahead. I'm not going to stop you. <laughs> well, we need some music. <laughs> <laughs> this, th oh, this, this is where we go into the deep fake. We could have uh, the Elon Musk uh, Havana Aguila. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I guess we'll, we'll 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 take a break now. Um, Maybe, you know, kick it off with some Havana Gila in the next session or something. Terrific. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>